Hello, and welcome to this afternoon's, this afternoon's program, an interview with Henry Petrusky, author of The Pencil, sponsored by the Thoreau Society, with interviewer Richard Smith. Today's program is part of Webinar Weekend and featured films. There is more day to dawn, a global conversation celebrating Thoreau's lasting legacy, June 13th and 14th. Henry Petrosky is Professor of Engineering and of History at Duke University. He has written a number of books on the history of everyday objects, among them The Pencil, The Evolution of Useful Things, The Book on the Bookshelf, The Toothpick, and The House with 16 Homemade Doors. His most recent book is The Road Taken, The History and Future of America's Infrastructure. His books have been translated into over a dozen languages, and he lectures nationally and internationally on topics small and large. Richard Smith has lectured on and written about antebellum United States and 19th century American literature since 1999. He has worked as a public historian in Concord, Massachusetts for 21 years, specializing in Henry David Thoreau, the Transcendentalist, the Anti-Slavery Movement, and the Civil War. He has written five books for Applewood Books. So I will now turn over our webinar to Richard Smith, and I will be monitoring the chats as the audience participants can send us questions that we'll have an opportunity to ask at about the 40 minute mark. Thank you, Mike. Hello, Thoreauvians and everybody else who is joining us from all around the world. It's a, absolutely a pleasure to be involved with the webinars this weekend. Uh, this is the book that we're gonna be talking about uh, by Professor Petrosky, The Pencil. And uh, Professor, it's a pleasure. Thank you for joining us here today. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure for me to be here. So the first question, over the last few years, probably the last decade, um, we've seen books produced about what we can call mundane things. There's a, there's a book about salt, a history of the codfish, a history of the rat. I, I recently read a book which is a history of the pine tree in America. So my first question to you is, why the pencil? Why did you want to write a book about the pencil? Well, it's a long story, but let me... Uh... Go ahead. We've got lots of time. Make it short. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, it actually started out as, as an engineering project. Uh, there was a technical paper I read that was about pencil points breaking. And uh, one of the things that engineers do, especially structural engineers, which I associate myself with, uh, when things, you want to know when things break, you want to be able to predict when things break, because that's how you design structures and machines uh, that don't break. So I, I uh, read this paper and uh, I found some places in it that could be expanded upon that I thought could be more um, refined in the analysis that was given. This was more or less mathematical analysis. But I wanted to make the paper a little more interesting, I thought, than just a straight technical paper uh, because it might have been considered by straight engineers, let's say, as uh, a little uh, too trivial, with, uh, <laughs> just being about a broken pencil point. So I thought I would, as an introduction, give a little bit of the history of the pencil. Uh, I started uh, looking uh, into that, and it wasn't that easy to find a comprehensive history, but I did in the process uh, come across the fact that uh, Thoreau did uh, make pencils with his uh, father and his family. Well, uh, that I found that fascinating uh, because here was somebody who was basically straddling the two cultures, if you will. And uh, I didn't need all that information for writing my paper, but I wanted to pursue it afterwards. And I did, and I started writing, uh, reading biographies of Thoreau and his works. I, I had read uh, 
many of his things before. And uh, I discovered that the pencil making at the time, now I'm talking about the roughly the mid 80s, mid to late 80s, 1980s, uh, there wasn't much discussion of uh, Thoreau and pencil making in at least the sources I read. So I, I began to pursue that increasingly. I'm just a curious fellow and like to write about curious things. And this uh, led to uh, uh, writing about the history of the pencil, which also uh, basically uh, was an unmined uh, topic at the time. Uh, oh. As far as it being a single topic book, uh, there weren't many uh, in, in my experience at that time. And again, we're talking about the mid 80s roughly. Uh, I wrote this book at the National Humanities Center in uh, Research Triangle Park in North Carolina, uh, which has a wonderful library system and wonderful librarians. So I, I could basically get any reference I wanted delivered to my desk in my study. And uh, I was able to do what I thought was a pretty, pretty thorough job. I, I have since learned that I, uh, you know, there, not everything was, uh, I discovered. But this idea of a single topic book was an oddity at the time. Uh, right. In fact, I think the pencil predated all those that you, you mentioned. But it, it, did. didn't, it wasn't the first. Uh, back in the uh, mid, mid 19th century, uh, the, the, there were a couple of scientists who wrote single topic books. Uh, Thomas Huxley wrote a book, he was a biologist, wrote a book uh, uh, which was a collection of, of uh, lectures actually on the, the, the flames. He wanted to explore flames. So his book was The Chemical History of a Candle. Of, yes, of a candle. Uh, another uh, single topic book was uh, On a Piece of Chalk. Uh, this was a, well, I guess I'd characterize him as a geologist in the context that I'm thinking. And uh, that was a very, that was a fascinating book. That also began as a lecture. There were a lot of uh, scientific lectures. These were all both Brit British people. So you weren't and, necessarily a Thoreauvian before you started working on, oh, the, on the pencil book. It was a happy oh, coincidence. I was, <laughs> I was an engineer. <laughs> but it, it wasn't my first effort at, at writing. I, uh, well, that's another story, I suppose, but uh, I was always fascinated with, um, oh, I would say, uh, uniting science and, and, and poetry and which, writing generally. Which is interesting you should say that because in a lot of ways, that's exactly what Henry Thoreau did. He, he often united science and poetry, <laughs> at least in his own mind. So. Uh -huh. So, um, so I guess another question that I have is, um, tell us a little bit about the Thoreau pencil business. Um, how good were the pencils? We, Thoreauvians like to think that Henry, quote, made the best pencils in America. I, is this true? Well, I, I think Ralph Waldo Emerson thought so at, at the, uh, toward the end of the pencil making business. Uh, at first, I don't think they, they were uh, extraordinary. And I think that's why Henry David uh, went to the extent that he did to improve the pencils that his family business was, was making. He uh, invented a machine and in this sense, he was being very much an engineer, what today we would probably call a mechanical engineer. He uh, apparently designed and built operated this machine that would crush uh, or would refine the graphite, meaning it would basically separate the pure graphite from the impurities that it comes out of the mine with. And uh, it was uh, quite good. And that's how you get the finest pencils is by having the purest graphite. The British around this time were running out of their pure graphite. Here we're talking about the 1840s, roughly. The British discovered graphite in Oh, the 17th century, I believe it was. Uh, and uh, they could take their graphite straight, straight out of the mine and make it into pencils. That, that couldn't be done with any other graphite around the world at the time. Uh, so it was important to uh, crush the graphite, basically separate the impurities and then uh, recombine the graphite in, in some way. And uh, Henry David Thoreau 
in, uh, in well, the 19th century. Um, I, I could never track this down, but somehow he seems to have come across the way the French were doing it. And if the, the French in the late, uh, late 18th century discovered that if you combine very good graphite with very good clay, you get a very good pencil lead. And uh, that's, that's what made the Thoreau pencils very good after you know, Henry developed these, um, this machine and the, the process. So, so for a it, while, so for yes. a while they, the Thoreau pencils were being made like everybody else's pencils in America. Uh, apparently, and, and what, right. that, what, what it means to everybody else's, uh, there, was, there were variations. So, right. But basically, right. yes. And supposedly, I mean, the story is that he got the idea from reading a, some sort of an encyclopedia at Harvard, but I'm not necessarily sure how true that story is. I tried to track that down. Uh, okay. I spent a lot of time trying to track that down. And because I was at the National Humanities Center, I, I could basically get any encyclopedia I wanted. And every encyclopedia that I looked at that he would have had access to, meaning, you know, going by publication date, uh, it, it, it did pan out. I could not find anything. Now, of course, that doesn't prove that he didn't, but um, there, there, there were a couple that maybe there was a hint if you infer things. Uh, it, he could have gotten the germ of the idea from them. Uh, so the, the, the story may be half true, let's say. But I didn't find in any encyclopedia the recipe. Let's put it that way. Well, Thoreau can be very maddeningly quiet on what we now consider major events in his life. And there's nothing in his journal that says, oh, by the way, I read this Scottish encyclopedia and I know how to make pencils now. <laughs> yeah. Well, but of course, uh, in making pencils, he was acting uh, as, a, as a businessman, really. And uh, what if he did come across this secret, if you want to call it, it would be called a trade secret today. And right. you wouldn't want to share it. You wouldn't want to publicize it at all because you're, you're, you had a great business advantage. And we know, at least I know from my research, that he did want to make money selling these pencils. He, he uh, you know, carried them to New York, for example, and trying to sell them to raise money for his tuition. Uh, right. This seems to be pretty well documented. So he wasn't uh, without uh, a motive to make money out of this, this product, uh, which means that he would have been motivated in my uh, understanding to keep it a secret so that his pencils had an advantage. Well, I also think that the motivation definitely probably came from his dad as well. I mean, it was thorough and son on those pencils. So That's right. I always, I always think that they had more of a, a partnership than a lot of people really give them credit for. I agree. And, but, and that's an interesting point because I've seen, um, uh, in, in fact, and in, in um, photographs, pencils claim to be Thoreau and they're stamped Thoreau and Sons, the plural. Right. Not, and Son. So I assume uh, either there's something that I don't know that you know, the name was changed at some point or uh, they're counterfeit. Well, I, well, his brother John died in 1842, so I think that if it's Thoreau and Sons, it's got to be pre-1842. That's right, exactly. So, I, I so, agree. so to go back a little bit before th the Thoreau family, um, is it true Concord, Massachusetts claims that the first pencil in America was made in Concord, Massachusetts? Is this true? Is it not true? Do we know? I don't think we know. Uh, I think uh, it depends on what you mean by the first pencil, for example. If somebody made a pencil for their own use, their private use, is, is that the first pencil made in America? Or are we talking about the first pencil made for commercial purposes to be sold? Right. It would be made in quantity. So I think the question has to be qualified in a way. I personally uh, would feel comfortable saying the first pencils in America were made in eastern Massachusetts, let's say that, because okay. there seems to have been a concentration of pencil making around 
that area at that time. And the Thoreaus weren't the only pencil makers in Concord anyway. That's right. Well, in Concord, I'm not sure there was a pencil factory in Concord until the Thoreaus actually started one up. But uh, I, I could be wrong about that. There were, so, there were Concordians, if that's the term that you use for citizens of Concord, who began making pencils, but they made them in, in outside Concord, as I understand it. Right. Mon Monroe, his pencil shop was not in Concord. Okay, so um, th in your book, you call Thoreau a civil engineer, or he was known as a civil engineer in his lifetime. What he did, called did himself that mean? Okay, what did that mean? It, what did that mean in the mid nineteenth century to be a civil engineer? Okay, well Thoreau called himself a civil engineer, and he and Prince called himself a civil engineer. So it's not that it was other people characterizing him as that. Uh, to understand that. Uh, the answer to that question you ask, uh, just a little history of the term civil engineering. That term did not exist, was not used before the late 18th century. Uh, there were military engineers uh, and the engine, term engineer didn't even have to be qualified because first basically all engineers were in service to the military in one form or another. And the military was in service to uh, cities. Uh, countries to protect. With, that's why we have so many forts around. Now, uh, West Point, of course, uh, existed to train military engineers. And uh, around the turn of the century, they began to offer courses in civil engineering to the military engineers, because this term civil engineering was introduced in Britain. And uh, its implication was that the engineers would not be doing military work so much as civilian work, meaning they were designing uh, water supplies, they were designing uh, grist mills and so forth, things that are not necessarily associated with defense or offense. If, if, like bridges? Excuse me? Bridges and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, well, the military always wanted to build bridges, so that, that it wasn't just bridges that distinguished them. I mean, bridges okay. go to Roman uh, 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 war days. But anyway, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 if we talk about profession of civil engineering, uh, most historians, as far as I know, define that as having oh, a society, somehow a official group that uses that term. That didn't happen until oh, the 1820s in, in Britain. There were, there were some uh, that go back that use the term civil engineering, but they were they were generally considered eating clubs or dining clubs, and they were very exclusive, and they were favored they favored the older engineers, and they just sat around and told war stories. But the young engineers who were coming up felt you know they were excluded, they were literally excluded, and they wanted to uh, benefit from the uh, well the experiences of other engineers, so they formed their own society and. That was called the um, Institution of Civil Engineers. It still exists today, uh, 1820s. I forget the exact date right now. In America, the American Society of Civil Engineers wasn't formed until 1852, but the term obviously existed before you know that. Uh, civil engineering uh, was engineering at the time. All these other terms that we use, mechanical and of chemical, those came, those came later to distinguish themselves from civil engineering. Thoreau, using the term, I would assume, I, I would assume he was trying to imply or convey uh, a sense that he was using something close to a scientific method. That was the implication of all this stuff. It was not just uh, somebody who said, oh, I can build that with, without any experience or without any credibility without any background in order to uh, to really build structures or let's say uh, lay out a railroad or build a building of some size or build a bridge a civilian bridge uh, there had to be some theory involved and that was developing at just about the same time as uh, Thoreau called himself a civil engineer now his engineering you could say he he engineered that uh, graphite 
refining machine. But uh, he mostly concentrated on surveying. Uh, and that's been closely associated with engineering uh, for, for a very, very, very long time. I mean, that's how, that's why some people call George Washington a, an engineer, for example. The uh, fact is that every engineering student, even today, has to know a lot about surveying because before you can start building a bridge or doing anything on the land, you've got to understand the land and its boundaries and so forth. So his, his calling himself an engineer was, I, I would say, uh, declaring his credibility, declaring his experience, declaring his, uh, um, oh, I would say, expertise, let's, let's say. And I'll just continue a little bit just to uh, reinforce that throughout the latter 19th century, everybody was calling himself an engineer without any credibility and a lot of things were breaking. Uh, a lot of deaths were caused by insufficiently strong bridges, let's say, or weak buildings. So around the um, early 20th century, uh, there began to be a crackdown on the use of uh, the term engineer, just generally, because uh, uh, it, it was considered an ethical issue to, to, to be just uh, blunt about it. You couldn't call yourself an engineer if you really weren't an engineer. Now, Thoreau also took some courses when he was at Harvard that uh, engineers take today. Uh, and well, all students did at the time, but uh, not everybody was educated, of course, at the time. Uh, official engineering education didn't start until, oh, around again, Thoreau's time. And uh, it was very, you, you uh, had a handful of people graduating from engineering schools before the middle of the 19th century. Well, but I was going to say that he didn't. He didn't go to Harvard to study engineering. He went to Harvard no, no. to become a to become a teacher. <laughs> That's but right. He, but 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 at the time, uh, uh, you know, a liberal education included what today we would consider so, sort of technical work. I mean, you look at his textbooks, for example. Uh, there's a, a book on mechanics. It's quite technical. It's it's you know got mathematics and so forth, which he also would have used for his his survey. So. Uh, a liberal education back then uh, was 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 much more liberal in a sense of breadth than than it is today in in most schools. Right. Yeah, I think that by all accounts, from his friends and family members, he had an incredibly analytical mind. Um, yes. He always wanted to know why something worked, how something worked. Why would you do that to make it work? When a house burned down, he would go and look at the remains of the house to see how the joists were put together. He yeah. was he was he was always searching for answers on literally everything. How does this work? And I think yeah. that I think that served him well in the pencil making business. <laughs> yes, what what you just described with the house is what engineers today would call failure analysis. When something doesn't work, it means that whoever designed it. And built it uh, didn't understand fully something or was trying to you know be a, be a scam artist but assuming they wanted to it to succeed um and you want to know why it failed you want to know what went wrong and, and that is a very analytical procedure and it's carried out today every airplane that malfunctions has a uh, failure analysis conducted on it by an official agency of the government so has the idea of civil engineering as a career or as a position, has it changed other than the technology? Has it changed a lot since Thoreau's day? If he were to suddenly appear today, would he recognize the idea behind civil engineering or, or what it means to be a civil engineer? The, the, uh, the field and the term has become much broader. Let's put it that way. Uh, it's become much more mathematical in some areas, um, he would probably be very pleased that one large part of it is uh, environmental engineering. Almost all civil engineering departments around the country today are called civil and environmental engineering. And uh, th this is uh, a big, big, big part of civil engineering. Uh, conservation, waste, waste uh, removal, waste treatment, and so forth. So uh, I think he'd be pleased by, by that development. Uh, I think he would recognize it in the sense 
of the process, the analytical process. You know, as you're describing the building, if something goes wrong today, engineers still want to understand it. They want to go to the scene of the failure, the collapse and uh, the fire, whatever. Uh, I think he'd fully understand that. Uh, the process, uh, and I've written about this uh, quite a bit, uh, the process, the, the analytical process, the, the intellectual process really is the same now as it was in ancient times. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I firmly believe that. I think you can uh, go to a book like Vitruvius and see it. Uh, in the Renaissance, you can go to a Galileo's work. Galileo was, was more of an engineer than uh, people credit him with. Uh, when he was uh, forbidden to uh, study the heavens you know, by the church, he basically uh, looked at uh, terrestrial things, meaning engineering. Why do things break? That was his question. Why do things break? That was not understood uh, in any uh, logical way back, back then. It, it was just taken as a fact. Uh, Galileo wanted to understand it more than just as a fact. So, so I think this, this idea of the essence of engineering, if you will, that's, that's as old as, as, old as uh, mankind, let's put it that way. Yeah, talking about engine thorough being a, a combination of civil engineer and poet, Galileo is a perfect example of art and civil engineering combining. You look at his drawings, technically they're beautiful, artistically they're just as beautiful. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, he's a, he was, well, a Renaissance man. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, there's a popular story among Thoreauvians that, that Henry Thoreau, and this story's been around forever, that he created a drill to, to make a hole for the pencils. Uh, true or false? <laughs> uh, uh, my, my answer would have to be false. I, uh, I mean, he may have attempted, uh, he may have uh, partially succeeded, I mean, I'll, I'll grant that because a lot, a lot of people were trying to do something like that. But uh, the way pencils were made back then is why people were trying to do it. The way pencils were made is uh, you have half a slab of, of wood, you made a groove in it, you put lead in it, then you glued on top of it a covering, and then you could shape it as round or hexagonal or whatever you wanted. But of course, whenever you glue a veneer on something, there's always the danger of it delaminating. And uh, if you have a solid piece of wood that you start with, and you just drill a hole through it, you've eliminated that problem of delamination. So it was sort of a holy grail in a way, but it was very impractical to uh, drill a hole. Uh, uh, it could have to be a pretty fine hole in a pretty small piece of wood. And, uh, and the technology was, just didn't exist. I, I, no, I don't, I don't think so. It, it, it didn't exist. And uh, it wouldn't be worth it because the way the pencils were made was a perfectly uh, good process. You just had to make sure you used good wood with a straight grain that didn't uh, bend and that caused the delamination. You had to use good glue. Uh, you use good materials and you can do things uh, very effectively. So, so I, I doubt that was, uh, that, was, uh, that was done as far as I know, the pencil makers, the, the really big pencil making uh, industry was not, uh, did not have a research and development effort to drill holes in pieces of wood. And uh, if it was something that would have, they would have seen as uh, uh, better than their standard procedure, they, they would have been pursuing it. But, but to the best of my knowledge, they weren't. So by 1850 though, or so, the Thoreaus really weren't making pencils anymore, were they? Uh, yeah, the, I, I forget the, I don't think the exact date can be known, but it was, yeah, somewhere in the 50s probably. Um, uh, they discovered, well, because of Henry's machine, they could make very pure graphite. And they, they even some of the ads that they, um, uh, uh, I won't say published, but uh, printed, had printed for them, mentioned that they sold not only pencils, but also plumbago. Plumbago was the old name for graphite. Uh, so uh, because they were selling plumbago, of course, people wanted to buy plumbago, who wanted to buy plumbago came to the Thoreau's. Uh, the story as I know it, as I understand it, is that one company uh, 
put in a very large order for plumbago, and the Thoreaus were a little suspicious. What are, what, why do they want so much uh, refined plumbago? And they thought, well, maybe they're trying to start a uh, rival pencil company, and uh, why should we sell them uh, this material to uh, compete with us? Uh, they finally uh, accepted the explanation that it was not intended to make pencils, but for a new printing process, electrotyping. So uh, yes, and then because that was so so uh, profitable and uh, easier, I mean, you, you didn't have to go use the graphite to make pencils. You just sold the graphite itself at a good, good price. Uh, the pencil making business for a while was uh, sort of a cover almost uh, for them selling the plumbago or the graphite. And as I understand it, eventually uh, the pencils weren't even manufactured or sold toward the end of the, roughly the end of the 50s. I believe that's when that happened. So where did they get their plumbago from? Do we know? Originally, as I understand it, and as far as I know, uh, throughout their involvement uh, from a mine in New Hampshire. But, uh, you know, that's another thing. If you're in business, you would not want that advertised. You would not that, want that known. That and I think that was, that was, on, that was the Uncle Charles's mine originally, I think, Origin in, the, in the 1820s. That's right. Yeah. And but then they, was, they got it from other places as well. I wouldn't be surprised. I think, uh, well, there were a lot of sources of graphite in that area, in the uh, New York State, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire area up there. Um, so yes, there were, there were sources, but none of them was pure enough to use directly for making pencils. That's why they had to be refined. They had to be set. The graphite had to be separated from the impurities. So they were mixing so because of, of Henry Thoreau, they were combining the, the plumbago with clay, correct? That's, that's correct. And he wanted to get the best clay he could also. And uh, he, uh, he went to sources that he knew were uh, excellent clay, and I believe they were in Europe. And what were they mixing it with before? What, what, was the clump, what would the plumbago be mixed with before the clay situation came about? Oh, they would mix it with anything that would make it stick together, basically. Uh, gum. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Yeah, glues. And, and that's why the pencils were not so good. They would be very scratchy. And so then that's what, you know, makes a good pencil today. One that writes smoothly, that doesn't have any impurities in it. Because if you have uh, sharp particles of, let's say, mica, you start writing on a piece of paper, and what do you do? Well, you rip the paper, you know, you press hard enough. So the, getting the excellent quality uh, plumbago and the excellent quality clay and mixing them together. Now, you couldn't just mix them together, and this was the secret. This was maybe not obvious, but you had to then fire them like, a, like ceramics. The pencil clays basically were ceramics. And uh, they are to this day. So uh, not only did you have to uh, do the mixing, but you, the, the, the rose must have had an oven somewhere. It didn't have to be a very elaborate oven because the pencil leads are obviously pretty, pretty small. And uh, they uh, could do a lot in a small area, a small volume of, of, uh, of an oven. Well, I think, I think the thorough pencil shop, and it was always attached to the various houses that they lived in, I, I always consider it kind of a fairly small mom and pop operation anyway. I mean, it was the family and maybe a couple of Irish boys that they would hire and, and that was about it. So, so the fact that they're producing all these pencils in a fairly small space is something that always kind of surprised me. Uh, mom and pop businesses are like that. that that's almost a definition in a small space. Uh, they don't have branch offices and so forth. Pencils are small items. Uh, so it's not that surprising to me. And, uh, and that's why I, I would call it a cottage. I call it a cottage industry in my book rather than a, an industry. Right. Uh, and that's what the, the term generally means. So uh, I, I think uh, a lot of uh, businesses, let's say, back then were this mom and pop type. And there was the 
it was the beginning of the time when the big conglomerates, let's say, well, they weren't conglomerates then, but big industry was uh, threatening the, um, the livelihood of the mom and pops. It became very difficult. So the, the, the only defense you had, if you're a small pencil making cottage industry, is to make the best uh, pencils you can. And the endorsement of, uh, of uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson was, was this extremely important, especially for the, uh, for the artistic community and, uh, and the engineering community. Engineers and architects use pencil and surveyors use pencils um, as there is pencils are as important to them as they are to artists. So the, yeah. we've, we've only got a couple more minutes before we start taking questions from our audience. So I guess I'd like to ask you uh, lastly, how important is Thoreau to the history of the pencil? Is he as important as Thoreauvians like to think he is? I mean, obviously you have a whole chapter about him in your book. So when we can proudly talk about pencils and Thoreau's place in the history of the pencil, is it as important as we think it is? Uh, in, in, in the big scheme of things, probably not. But, uh, you know, if you want to understand him, uh, since he did call himself an engineer, uh, I think it is important in that regard. I, I think it is important for uh, your field, uh, I'd say definitely, uh, in the big history of, uh, big picture history of the pencil making, let's say, it, it's a chapter. Uh, literally, it's a chapter in my book. It's, uh, and it, 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 it just flows uh, organically in uh, what I tried to do in the book. Uh, you know, I don't just talk about Thoreau in that chapter. I talk about the encyclopedias. I talk, talk about this, this method and so forth. And there's some engineering talk in there. But, but I, I found the Thoreau uh, story uh, fascinating and I didn't think it was widely known and uh, had fun researching it and writing about it. Uh, but I, I wouldn't want to overemphasize. That's for you fellas actually to determine whether how important it is for your research for the, for the engineering and, uh, and, uh, and pencil making. Uh, it's a chapter. I, I think that's fair. And a chapter is nothing to sneeze at. That's, that's, uh, I don't mean that in any derogatory sense. Yes, he's, he's the most important history maker, pencil maker in the history of the world, <laughs> according to us. Well, you can claim that. <laughs> so, well, Professor, it's been absolutely a pleasure talking to you. I can see that Mike has joined us again. And uh, Mike, do we have any questions from the audience? Well, I have a question, and um, since I haven't posed any of my own questions in the other webinars today, I'll take that liberty now. So in Walden, Thoreau writes, you will pardon some obscurities, but there are more secrets in my trade than in most men's, and, and yet not voluntarily kept, but inseparable from its very nature. Now, you can sort of unpack the meaning of that, but I've always wondered if um, that, uh, that whether or not he has the pencil trade in mind when he says that there are many secrets to his trade. Um, and particularly, I remember reading in your book about um, the company in Boston that the Thoreau's eventually began working with, Smith Smith and McDougal, and uh, that that there is um, you know a corporate element to this. So, can you speak to that, Professor Petrotsky? Yeah. Well, well, uh, Thoreau's family was certainly interested in making money. They didn't make pencils for the joy of it. They they wanted to sell them, and therefore they you know wanted to make money. As far as the Thoreau quote about my trade. Uh, I, I uh, would tend to interpret that as a very broad, broad term that he was using. What was his trade? Um, his trade was really uh, understanding the world. And understanding the world, was, or nature, if you will, however you want to term it, was, was not just natural things that grow and uh, flow in streams, but things made. Uh, we, we are natural people. We make things. 
that in a way makes them natural too, extensions of, of, the na of nature. Now we call them artificial, we usually call them artifacts and things like that. And it's to separate the, what does really grow organically from what comes from a, 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 an idea that somebody has. But I can see where all of this was consistent for Thoreau. It was all one trade. His life was a trade in a, in a way. But, uh, you know, that's getting a little off the subject. <laughs> hmm. But I think that they went to extreme lengths, the family, I should say, through the 1850s, as, as Professor said earlier, about keeping the whole plumbago thing a secret. And they had this, um, this almost this subterfuge. They kept making pencils while they're still selling the, the plumbago to the electrotyping companies in Boston. So I think that they're kind of, they're guarding their secrets as closely as they can so that they can make as much money as they can. That's right. But you know, announcing you're selling something and uh, that doesn't give away a secret. In fact, that makes your stuff more valuable if other people can't uh, reproduce what you're selling, can't make it as, uh, as pure or as good. Uh, so I, I don't associate that it, itself as uh, a trade secret. Um, I think I, I, I can remember a, an advertisement for their pencils and plumbago from the 1840s, if I remember, the mid 40s at least. Uh, so, so they weren't keeping that a secret at all. It was the secret was how to make it, how to refine it. That was the secret. So now a few questions from our audience. Uh, one person asks, is Henry David Thoreau's graphite grinding machine still in existence? Oh, uh, do they mean, if they mean the machine, I don't know, you guys would know better than that. Uh, if, if they mean the technology, uh, it, it's uh, not used uh, today. There, there are, you know, technology advances. So we're talking about something from a century and a half ago. Uh, they've they've improved that uh, pencil industry has improved on that. Uh, I, I don't think any engineer uh, worth his salt ever thinks that uh, he's reached the end of the road and nobody's going to be able to improve on what he he did. Throughout the 19th century, especially into the 20th century, you look at patents, and I've I've uh, studied patents quite a bit as pieces of literature actually, and uh, so many of them are called titled an improvement on. Uh, so uh, the, the inventors don't think of themselves as, uh, as a rule, doing something totally unique. They are making an incremental improvement on, on something. That's how technology really advances. That's how science advances too. And I'd argue that probably literary criticism advances the same way. <laughs> If the, if and, the, and somebody asks a follow-up question on that one. Um, does any description exist of Henry's graphite purifying machine? How it worked? Is yes. there a... Yeah, I've seen, I've seen uh, read descriptions of it, and I think I describe it in my book. Uh, maybe not in great detail, as I understand it, he made drawings of it. Uh, the way it worked was pretty simple. Uh, you crush the graphite. This is how... Everybody made pencils at the time. You start out by crushing the graphite. The finer you crush it, the better. But then how do you separate the graphite itself as a powder now from the impurities? Well, basically uh, you blow it up into the air and the graphite is lighter than the impurities. Uh, in Thoreau's machine, he basically uh, built a tall machine, as I recall, it was like seven feet tall or something, you know, like the height of a ceiling. Uh, or it, it sat on a table and then it was seven feet above, above that. Uh, and then the light graphite would rise and there was a shelf up at the top that it would settle down into like dust. It literally was dust. And then that was collected. That was the pure graphite. And then what you do with it from there uh, depends on what your product is, whether you want to make uh, sheets of plumbago or you want to make pencil leads and so forth. But yeah, I, I think there's enough out there that it could probably be reconstructed. Okay. And then there was a comment somebody mentioned um, during the portion when we were trying, when we were thinking about 
when the pencil business began in the United States, um, somebody commented that William Monroe of Concord inaugurated pencil making in America at the time of the War of 1812. I've heard that. Yeah, well, um, the War of 1812 meant that the U.S. couldn't get imported pencils from, mainly Britain was the principal source at the time. Uh, I see. Uh, and in, in volume, at least. Uh, so because of the war, uh, then that, that was driving Americans to try to produce pencils domestically. Uh, whether uh, William Monroe was the first, I don't think that is necessarily supported uh, totally by, uh, well, documentation I've seen. I think there were precursors. Uh, that's not to say that they uh, uh, did as much as, as Monroe did, but, uh, you know, that, that gets into sticky. Uh, that's a sticky issue. <laughs> okay. It's always difficult to uh, identify who did what first. Right. Well. And, and real quickly to answer the question about the actual thorough grinding machine, no, as far as we know, it does not exist anymore. Oh, okay. Well, that, that's not surprising either. If, uh, if, for example, it was put in a corner of their uh, workshop or whatever you want to call there, uh, where they produce this stuff, um, it would have been after, let's say, after uh, the family was, was di that died out, say, after Henry himself died, it would have been part of the estate, let's say, and uh, it would probably have been surpassed, it would have been surpassed in technology by that time, so it would not have been seen as something valuable other than you know, today it would be seen as a, a wonderful artifact to have for a Thoreau museum. That's not what people were thinking about back then. It's one of those Thoreauvian holy grails. <laughs> yeah. it, I, you know, it's possible it could exist somewhere, but uh, I, I, I would doubt it. Right. Okay, well, I think that we can conclude here. Um, Professor Petrosky, thank you so much for joining us. Um, looking forward to um, having you as our keynote speaker in 2019. And then when we weren't able to move forward with that, um, having this webinar is just a, um, well, I suppose this is one of the unexpected joys of the COVID-19 crisis is that we were able to uh, put together a webinar series and to host you and to finally hear you talk about Henry David Thoreau and the history of the pencil. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And I apologize again for not being able to make the, uh, the gathering. Uh, I was really flat out of my back. Uh, I, was, I was in <laughs> terrible health at the time. I, I'm much better now. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're glad you could join us. Absolutely. One thing I would like to add if, to our viewers, if, if you have enjoyed today's programs and this webinar, there's more to come. Uh, and if you are not a member of the Thorough Society, we would love to have you join. Uh, if you want to go to thoroughsociety.org, you can do it online. And uh, we, we really uh, would love to have you as a member. And if you've enjoyed this program, we do a lot of these sort of things throughout the year. So please become a member and, uh, and join us for all of our programs. Thanks, Richard. And just a, uh, an announcement before we conclude that um, this evening, we hope you will watch um, the film, The Penobscot, and join us at 8 p.m. for an evening Q&A with the Penobscot Nation sponsored by the Thoreau Society and the Penobscot Nation. We'll be joined with um, interviewers, myself, <clears throat> myself and Ron Hogue, and guest speakers, Christopher Succalexis, Chris Charlie Brown Francis, James Pardilla, James Eric Francis Sr., Jennifer Neptune, and J. Brian Wenzel. And again, that's tonight at 8 p.m. Professor, thank you so much. Thank you. I enjoyed it.